Thanks very much, Dave. Well, it's lovely to be here, and you will be delighted to know that I will be brief, because I usually am. But I'm going to try and um, draw some links between uh, what we've heard earlier, uh, just now, and my talk. And I think the strand there is Mireya talked a lot about banging your head on the desk, and Konstantinos talked at the beginning of his talk about the time he is spending in his lab replicating other people's studies that should never have been published in the first place. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I think I'm going to try and be a bit more positive and uh, recognize that actually we could be doing better and the research community could, community could be doing better at measuring uh, this new phenomenon, e-cigarette use. So just to kick off, I'm going to steal a couple of slides from Hayden McRobbie, who's not here, but many of you will know him. Uh, this is a question that was asked at a conference in the US recently. I know Clive put this on his blog. So academics, clinicians in the room were asked this question. And at the Global Tobacco Dependence Treatment Summit, only 33% of the attendees agreed that the long-term use of non-combustible nicotine um, was acceptable, uh, strongly agree or somewhat agree. So that was their view. And we asked that question last week in our national UK smoking cessation conference, exactly the same question. We polled the audience and this was the response. So you have two very different points of view from different sides of the Atlantic being asked exactly the same, pretty well-structured question. And I think most of you know the reasons for that. But how you ask a question is not the only issue. It's some of the other things that are going on in the background. And that's what I'll talk about. So you all know that the global picture on electronic cigarettes and alternative nicotine delivery devices is very varied. Um, and we have different policy and regulatory frameworks. Um, and this provides an opportunity for research, but it also means that we need to be asking consistent questions across countries to inform policy rather than creating more confusion and alarm. And what I'm going to talk about just for the next few minutes is use of e-cigarettes, so not safety um, uh, or, or the profile of, of the constituents of the product as Konstantinos has just done, but I'm going to talk about studies that assess prevalence and then these are studies that go on to draw conclusions about the relationship between use and different outcomes. And these are often surveys or cohort studies or longitudinal research. And a lot of these, I would argue, are at the moment simply answer, asking the wrong questions. We've got a big task on our hands. So a range of recent studies have drawn conclusions about e-cigarette use that simply are not supported by the study's findings. Now, most of us in the room are pretty cynical about this issue now, and we know that there are plenty of agendas out there that drive how people interpret their results. But sometimes, if you look carefully at the studies, it's because the wrong questions were asked of consumers in the first place, the response categories were combined when the questions were asked, or important distinctions were simply not understood by the researchers. And let's face it, there's a lot of people working in this field who still don't understand the phenomena they're dealing with, and that's understandable in some cases. So a couple of um, examples. I thought I'd start with one that was from my own university. And some of you have heard me talk about this before because I became so angry about this study um, and the response that it had in the press. Here in my, lo in my local community in Edinburgh where I live, I had my son's parents send me this newspaper article. Um, and this was on the basis of one cross-sectional survey. And essentially what the team, not, not people I directly work with, but what others in my university had done, was they had asked uh, to examine the relationship between e-cigarette point of sale exposure, so marketing at the point of sale, and use in young people. And they had a sample of almost 4,000 secondary school pupils in Scotland, and they were asked to complete, complete one cross-sectional survey in school. And the study found a cross-sectional association between self-reported recall of e-cigarette point-of-sale displays and use of or intention to use e-cigarettes. So what the, uh, what the authors argued is that just by seeing an e-cigarette display in a shop, a child was more likely to try an e-cigarette. That was their argument. And here's what they asked the young people in the study. First of all, this is reasonable, they were asked, had they heard of e-cigarettes? And if they had, they were asked which one of the following is closest, I should say closest, to describing your experience of e-cigarettes. I've never used them. I've tried to use them once or twice. I use them sometimes. I use them often, more than once a week. That's probably not bad, but then look at what they did. They then dichotomized to ever tried or never tried. 
So basically, you had a category of children who'd ever tried them, and you had another category of children who'd never tried them. And then they asked them a range of questions on whether they could remember seeing e-cigarette displays in shops. So the first thing is, a bunch of the young people didn't answer the e-cigarette question, maybe didn't understand it, or didn't think it was relevant. And in the paper, it's difficult to determine use, as it's not reported in the text, and differences by current smokers and non-smokers are not reported as frequencies. And just under 20% answered that they tried an e-cigarette. So I asked the authors for the data. And when they sent me a table that wasn't in the paper, there were only six, six children out of almost 4,000 who were never smokers who regularly used e-cigarettes on the basis of a point of sale display or something else. And this seemed to me a fairly fatal omission given the press headlines that the study generated, which were then used locally to argue for not only did we need to ban all forms of e-cigarette advertising that are included in our domestic legislation in Scotland, but actually we needed to remove the point of, point of sale marketing as well. So what about adults? Just very briefly, most of you will be familiar with this study. Uh, generated some headlines essentially showing that e-cigarettes lower the chances of quitting tobacco or stopping tobacco use by 28%. What they aimed to do was look at the association between use and smoking cessation among adult smokers, irrespective of their motivation for using electronic cigarettes. They did a systematic review and a meta-analysis common approach. And what they concluded was, as currently being used across the world, e-cigarettes are associated with significantly less quitting among smokers. And this is the meta-analysis. So this is the paper that was published, the studies that were included. And in the, the, the studies, there are so many things wrong with this review, as most of you know, and Clive and um, uh, Carl Phillips and the Truth Initiative and others have, wrote, have written about it. But if you look at the original studies, one of the fundamental problems is that the questions are not consistent. And if you're not asking consistent questions, you cannot compare these studies. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to do that. And we are commonly seeing either ever use or past 30 day use as a measure of prevalence. And I believe, and, and I think most of you know this, that in, in partnership with the safety concerns that we see from poor studies, also the data on prevalence, children using it, et cetera, contributes to these harm perceptions. And I'm showing you this because this is the updated slide from the UK, where we now have four years of data from ASH and YouGov showing that the proportion of um, people who think that um, e-cigarettes are more or equally harmful than tobacco continues to go up year on year. This is because of poor research and those poor headlines. But the f last couple of minutes, I just want to focus on what we should do. And the, the point I want to make is that we spent decades researching tobacco use uh, on the legacy of Michael Russell's work and others in the room. And we have pretty good questions on smoking. Cigarettes are actually fairly straightforward. And, and, and other forms of tobacco, we can assess that as well. But we don't have these consistent questions on e-cigarettes. And if you just look at the contrast here in one study between the, the reason, reasonable sophistication of how smoking was measured and then the very blunt, inaccurate way that e-cigarette use was measured, and then in the, in the US National Youth Survey, again, standard measures on smoking and really what I would regard as very poor questions on e-cigarette use. You can't draw reliable conclusions from these types of questions. So I'm just going to briefly mention what I think some of the basic prevalence or use questions should be in the studies that we conduct. I'd be interested in anybody's views on these after the session, and we're writing a paper on this at, mo at the moment. So the point is we can't get rid of bias, and we can't get rid of particular agendas. But as a researcher, we can ask better questions. Um, and these uh, will need to be adapted as the technology uh, develops through time and as markets change, but it's a start. So I think we need to get the terminology right. Uh, electronic cigarettes, e-cigarettes, electronic nicotine delivery devices, ENDS, alternative nicotine delivery systems, e-sheetas, electronic vapor products. It's very confusing. So what term do we use? We should probably use the term that vapors use, or the terms that they use, terms that people can understand. So that's the first point. Secondly, in some countries, it's probably still important to ask about awareness. In others, like here in the UK, the US, we probably don't need to ask that question anymore. We still want to ask about lifetime use because, of course, people stop using these products and we might want to know about what they used in the past and whether that was relevant. And crucially, we need to ask in these studies about frequency of use. And we need standard questions. And we propose a first question about ever use and then um, a question with five response options about frequency of current use. 
Uh, another uh, few what I would regard as crucial things to ask, device characteristics, obviously. So that includes nicotine content, uh, the type of device, and I think now we have some standard categories. Of course, we need to change that as new technology comes on the market. Flavors, probably not in a lot of detail, but in some. Tricky issue is how do we measure consumption? Really hard, so uh, Constantina said about how much e-liquid somebody uses. If you're using a disposable device, you can assess it a different way, but we need to ask about consumption. In some studies, ask about reasons for use, and our paper focuses on key questions in adults, but we need key questions in youth as well. And then just as a concluding thought, one of the things we can do to improve research in this area, and you know, this is a consumer phenomenon, it's relevant to study it, it's appropriate to study it, it's useful to study it, and it's fascinating to study it. But I think researchers need to speak to each other more, and what we've tried to do in the UK, uh, chaired by Anne, organized by Martin Dockrell, and the organization that I work for some of my time, Cancer Research UK, we now have a national forum for researchers. We meet regularly. We also provide a monthly evidence briefing on the interesting studies, which I can send or we can circulate to anyone who's interested. And if we keep the dialogue going, then I hope um, some of the uh, points that Marewa made earlier about how the research community has contributed and continues to contribute to misconceptions, fear and harm in this area, I don't think we can do away with that, but I certainly think we can improve what we're doing at the moment. So just to conclude, there's a lot of poor research, and I've only talked about problems with assessing use. Standard questions are helpful to allow comparison and also replicability. I think the research community is making progress in agreeing some core questions. And crucially, as we've already heard, to keep doing this and to do it better, we need to work with vapors to make sure we're using the terms that make sense, we're doing useful research, and we're keeping up to date. So thank you very much.